Welcome to another episode of our mini podcast, I Built a Company That Makes a Difference by B1. Here, we talk to founders of sustainable businesses to get their quick takes on how and why they started their companies and lessons learned along the way. Today, we're talking to Nora Young, the founder and owner of Candy Colored Girl, a very, very cool Brooklyn-based vintage clothing store. Nora, a big welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm really, really excited to do this. We're really excited to talk to you. So you've worked in the vintage clothing industry and the clothing and fashion industry in general for kind of a long time now, both as a passion and as a hobby and as a profession. Yeah, yeah. I've loved clothes ever since I was a little girl. That was like, I was such a mild-mannered child. But when it came to clothes, I had very strong opinions. So and I yeah, read on I, your, I, sorry, go ahead. No. No, I was go go ahead. I was gonna say I went to school for costume design, and like oh, did just you? Mm -hmm, yeah, that's pretty much like clothing's all I've ever done. Oh, that's amazing! I read on your website that you started like sewing from a really young age, but I didn't know you have like actual training in costume design. That's very cool. Yeah, yeah, I really, I really enjoy it. It was like kind of fell into it by accident. I was going to college for theater to be an actor, which is so stupid because I'm terrified of people. I'm terrified of talking. Like I'm really, I'm really shy and I try really hard to overcome it. But theater was such a weird way to go. But then I fell into the costume shop and it was, it was perfect. It was magic. How did you get on the path then knowing that you're so shy? How did you get on the path then to majoring in or wanting to become an, an actor in the first place? How did that come about? Uh, I think in high school, we were in theater, and I feel like it was something fun that I did with my sister. I have a twin sister, and we kind of did everything together, and all my friends were in theater, so I kind of went that way, and it felt good. It just felt fun to do it because I'm so shy. I was like, I have to. I have to do something. I can't just be an introvert my whole life. Okay. Uh, all right. And then when did you feel like, okay, you know what, this, I'm... I'm so much more interested in the costume, making costumes, I guess, the kind of creative expression. When did that kind of flip switch? That was, so when I went to college, my friend um, Jojo, who <laughs> lived next door to me, she was also a theater major. And you had to do, you had to work in the scene shop and you had to work in the costume shop just as a regular theater major. And I was like, oh, I, I was in the scene shop and I was like, oh, I hate this. I hate this. And I was like, and I don't even like the acting classes. I can't do this. And she was like, wait till you get to the costume shop. There's this woman who runs at Laurel. Laurel and you are going to hit it off and you're going to love it. And she was right. I loved Laurel. And I ended up having to be in the costume shop for my major, but also then that was my work study. So I was there all the time. Okay. All right. So then can you talk to us about the jury? I'm going to Talk about, I want to talk, because I really think that County Colored Girl is really a cool store. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about that in that journey. And then we'll back up and talk about some, you know, because you've worked in, in clothing before that. So can you talk to us about the journey to opening up Candy Colored Girl? Yeah, um, I feel like it was like the quickest answer is that I had a roommate who I met through a store I was working at. She was a customer. We became friends. She moved in. Uh, we had a couple of bottles of wine and she was like, I think it's time for you to open your own shop. And I was like, yeah, I think you're right. And she was like, I know you like to overthink things. She's like, don't think about it. Just do it. Now's the time. Just do it. And like a couple of days later, I talked to my best friend who we've, we've gone to college together and we've done everything together. He has his, his own business. And I was like, I think I want to open the shop now. And he was like, okay. And that was it. <laughs> Wait, what year was this? What years are we talking about? Uh, that's like five years ago. Five years ago. So just, you were like, okay, now it's time. Yeah. I had a little Etsy shop. Um, I'd been working with so much clothing and collecting so much vintage uh, that I had an Etsy shop, but I'm really bad with computers. <laughs> like, I don't even own a computer. And so like, it was, I have an iPad. That's like, I call it my big phone. Um, and that works. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to have a shop and I had all this vintage already and I've been working in shops forever. So um, there are some small business classes you can take for free in New York. Um, so I took those and they were really helpful. And every time I took a class, I was like, this feels right. Like, yes, 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 I'm on the right path. 
And I probably opened the store within a year of saying I was going to do it. Okay. So that was my, that was going to be next, my next question from kind of planning to conception to open all of that prep that took about a year. Yeah. You know, I found an old journal once um, and it was like almost 10 years ago to the day where I opened my shop. But a friend of mine had said, well, where do you want to be 10 years from now? And I described the whole shop down, down to the delicate light fixtures. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. So with it, so you were journaling in your 10 year plan. It was like, I want to open a shop that you described really in detail. Yeah. And then almost 10 years to the day mm -hmm. you had opened your shop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So can you talk, cause there are a lot of, um, small business owners that listen to us and or aspiring small business owners. Can you talk about the fun that was like finding the location and maybe like zoning and outfitting any refitting that you had to do? What was that process like of just like getting a space, finding a space, but then making it the space that you needed it to be? Oh my gosh. I am. Um, I'm a big fan of manifesting. And I was, I was, when I opened the shop, I was like, meditating and doing yoga every day and I remember Michael my best friend who was sort of helped me through the process was like I think it's time to like look at spaces he's like well just look get our feet wet you know and I was like yeah okay and I wanted to open a shop in bed which I did um because I live here I've lived here for almost 13 years now and there weren't a lot of shops and I was like why do I have to get on a train to travel to go shopping? There should be a little shop around here. Um, so that was really important to me that it be in bed -Stuy. And Michael called me one morning. I had just done a yoga class and they said, you know, like, it's important to listen to your gut. Always remember to listen to your gut. And I was like, and Michael called. And he's like, let's just go look at the space. It's literally three blocks from my apartment. And he's like, well, just go see. And it was out of my price range. I thought, yeah, I thought I could handle around 2000 a month for starting rent. Um, and this place was like, I don't know, like almost 3000. So we go and we look at it and it's perfect. Like as soon as I walked in, I could see everything, just everything. And the realtor was looking at me and he was like, I can see you seeing this. And I was like, yeah. And, and I was, Michael was like, this is the first place we're looking at. And the guy was like, sometimes it is the first place and you have to feel it in your gut. And I was like, oh my God. And then he was like, you know, and the rent's 2000. And we were like, what? And they were like, we just lowered the rent. And I was like, stop it. That's the only space I ever looked at. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Um, that is a, uh, that's an amazing story. Yeah. That is a really amazing story. Okay. And then what yeah. about the, like, was it, did you need to change a lot of stuff inside of it? Or did you just need to style it the way that you needed it? I just styled it the way that I needed it. I, um, we painted the walls, we painted the ceilings, Michael put up the racks and put in some molding. Um, he's super handy like that. So I was really lucky to have him. And, um, there's this big, beautiful dresser in there where I keep like the really special vintage pieces and it's huge. And when I first said I wanted to open a shop again, manifesting, I was at a Salvation Army and I found this dresser and I was like, oh my God, this is just, I need it. And I took a photo of it and I thought about it for forever, for like months, right? Ever since I had the idea, I found the dresser and then it was almost a year till we found the space. And I went to the Salvation Army and I was like, please be there, please be there. And it was there. It had been taken apart and it was in the back of the store, but it was still there. And I went to the person and I was like, I want this dresser. And they're like, oh, it's about to be shipped out. You know, we don't sell anything without a price tag. And I said, I know. And I was like, but what if I have a photo with the price tag on it? And they were like, do you? And I was like, yeah, because this was like my whole inspiration. <laughs> and then so they gave it to me. And that was, there was a Salvation Army close to where the store is that closed. But me and Michael pushed it down the street into the store. <laughs> oh, my God. So wow, all of this is like you were meant to have this store, basically. Yeah, totally. I really I feel strongly about that. Wow. OK, so now opening up, if you had to redo this again, knowing what you know now, would you have done anything differently? Yeah, I think so. As much as I love having the space and it is magical. So I don't know that I would want to change it, but the block I'm on, 
I'm the only business on that block and it's often just covered in trash. Like it's a dirty, mm -hmm. dirty block. And I wish it was quieter and I, it's hard to get people to come in. I feel like the reason there are no stores in bed is because people don't come to shop in bed -Stuy. Right. Right. Okay. And see, have you, have you seen that changing like over the last five years or that's, it's a residential area. People don't come to shop and that hasn't really evolved. It comes and goes because, oh, so <laughs> uh, when COVID happened, we shut down the store the day after my one year anniversary. So all the customers, the base I sort of developed during that time, they pretty much all scattered and left. So then it was like starting over again. Um, and I feel like I'm still building it up. And I've done a lot of changes to the shop. Like there wasn't a bunch of stuff outside. And now I have like a little, I make a little living room area on the street out there. And I've got a mannequin and I've got um, a neon heart in the window. Man, and that heart, that draws people in. Does it? Okay, cool. Yeah. So what, from your background, because let's go back to kind of everything that you've experienced and done in your past life that's prepared you for this particular store, whether it's business or just working in vintage clothing, what are all of the things that you've done that you feel like have really prepared you for being a business owner and owning, can I call it CCG? Yeah, totally. Can that's, yeah, yeah, that's what we say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think everything I've done has led me here, to be honest, like, and if that feels really good to say, um, like the costume design, learning how to sew, because I do a lot of upcycling in the shop and I do a lot of repairing the vintage. And um, you do it yourself. So, yeah. Yeah. I just sit in the store and I sew, um, which I love. That makes me super happy. Um, so doing the costume shop helped. Um, and then for a while I worked in a bead store and they taught me how to make jewelry. And that's a skill I love having. And I make a lot of the jewelry in the shop. So that was great. Um, I worked at Urban Outfitters for a while. And um, I loved their Urban Renewal line. And that was where they took vintage pieces. And they did a lot of upcycling then. And I was like, what is this? I was like, this stuff is really good. I was really attracted to that. And then I worked at this consignment shop, Poor Little Rich Girl. And that's where I think I really fell in love with vintage because coming, especially from like Urban Outfitters, which I, I, I like the clothes there. I was like, oh, I don't know how I feel about secondhand. I don't know that I want to wear someone else's clothes. And like, I think that was valid, but being around it so much and like the girls I worked with were so passionate about the vintage that I was like, oh yeah, like this is good. This is really good. And like, I've never wanted to look like everyone else obviously. And, um, it was a good way to like find your own style. No one's trying, when you go into a secondhand shop, no one's trying to tell you what the trends are or what you should be wearing. You just find the pieces that you love. And then when I moved to New York, that was all in Boston. And when I moved to New York, I was working at Buffalo Exchange. So then I was already so in love with vintage and all this vintage was coming in, but like it wasn't super valued. And I was like, these are precious babies and we have to take care of them. You know, so then I think that's where I was really like, I want to have a vintage shop because I want to protect these pieces and I want them to go to the right homes. Um, and then I worked in a boutique for a while that was really nice and very small. And then I was working by myself in this little boutique. So I was used to working alone and used to working hard and never taking breaks. And there was no vacation and there were no raises. And I was like, that's where my friend came in. And she was like, if you're working this hard, like work for yourself. Yeah. Yep. That makes perfect. I have a lot of questions now that based okay. on what you just said. <laughs> Can I start with how... What's your experience being such an introvert? Because you reference it a little bit in your online presence, being such an introvert and being a business owner, having to do some of these things, talk to people a lot, network, be part of your community. How has that experience been? And has that evolved the way that you kind of move through the world? Oh, man, I can't tell you how much it's evolved, like how amazing it's become. Um, but after I graduated college, I like made a very, very specific decision. Um, to interact with people. And I wanted to work in retail because that forced me to talk to people. And I was like, if I don't do this, I will never talk to a human being ever again. I would be happy to never speak to anybody. And so when I would go to work, I'd have to put on this persona and I would know how scared I am to walk into a place, 
And I would imagine someone else being that scared. So I was like, I have to take care of them and I have to make them feel comfortable. And that's just kind of been who I am for my life. And I'm glad I made that decision um, because I've made so many friends, like so many friends. I mean, having the shop in bed I've worked in retail forever. And the people who come into my shop are the best people I've ever met, like truly. And they're my neighbors. And now I have this little network of amazing girlfriends because they've come into the shop and they live in the area. And it's like my little new family. Would you, I imagine there are a lot of um, business owners and aspiring business owners who are introverted, shy, timid, just, you know, and what would you give us as a suggestion or recommendation or actionable tip? Because if you're hesitant or shy to engage with lots of different people, then there, but there's still things that you need to get done for the business. What are some tips that you've learned or you could give about getting over that or being able to engage despite having some of these fears? You mentioned putting on a different persona. Anything oh. else that you could that you could suggest? Man, that's a good question. I think for me, uh, I know being disciplined is really important. So making sure I get it done. Like, like I get, there's so much fear in having your own business. You know, I worry if it's okay, if it's not okay. There's a lot of personal stuff that happens in my life when I open the shop. Like my dad died and my sister who I lived with had to move home to take care of her mom because she has Parkinson's and now I live with strangers. And so I feel like there's so much fear in my life that I've given myself permission to not date anymore because I'm like, I'm afraid to talk to people. And I'm scared to do that. This morning, I'm, of course, super excited to be doing this with you, but I was really scared. And I was like, you have to. This is for your business. You have to do it. And I'm so happy I am doing it. And I'm obviously more comfortable once once I'm, you know, I, I'm face to face with someone. It's fine. But I think, I don't know, just be disciplined, push yourself, do it and do unto others that you would have done unto you. But that's also super interesting. And I think really a good point that you just made when you look at every, all of the different touch points in your life and you think, okay, you know, we, we know as entrepreneurs that it will, oh God, it's, it's just relentless, right? There are so many yes. things that have to be done and there's so many scary things. So if you look yes. at all of the touch points in your life and say, okay, I, I have to do this one. I'm going to pull back on this other thing over here just yes. to keep myself sane, but look at it as a, your holistic, everything, all of the touch points that you've got social engagements or non-social engagement, just engagement that you have to do, which ones are absolutely mandatory? Where can you pull back? That's a good point. Yeah. All right. Let's... Yeah, but everything, mm -hmm. everything I do for the business, like, again, I've made so many friends through the business. Like, it's always, it always comes back to me. Yeah. That's a good way to, that's a good one, too. When you put something out there and it boomerangs back to you. Yeah. Hmm. Can we just pump up and promote the store a little bit? I haven't even yeah. asked you yet. Like, can you just do, do a, tell us as a promotion, what all is in the store? I, I know you that you offer way more than just clothes. You just mentioned jewelry. You, there are some other things. Just tell us what's, what's available. Uh, so my, my favorite thing are the upcycled pieces. Um, I like my new favorite thing. Uh, I just cut up a kimono that I had. It's beautiful. It's vintage. I had it hanging in my room forever. I never wore it. And I had hemmed it because I'm short. And I had all this extra fabric in the hem. So I was, I pin butterflies in the shop. I sell like little tiny taxidermy things like pin butterflies and, and bones and stuff like that because I'm weird. Um, but I cut up part of the kimono at, to put the background for the pin butterflies but I cut it too short and I was like, oh no. So then I cropped the entire kimono. So it's a little cropped kimono, which is super cute. And then I made a denim jacket. I took a piece of the kimono. I, I put it on the back of the jacket and it had some other pieces. So now that's a cute denim jacket. Then I took an army jacket and put a big patch of the kimono on the back. So it's like soft and rough. And I like that juxtaposition. So there's a lot of pieces like that in the shop. Um, and then, you know, regular cute vintage things. And then I probably sell the most of just secondhand pieces, but like just cute secondhand pieces. Yeah. A little, saw... girl, Go ahead. 
a little girl came into the shop once. I have a lot of little girls who come in. So I have a small selection of kids clothes just because I love them. They're funny. They have really good ideas. This girl came in the other day and I had gummy bear necklaces that I made. And she's like, I want this, but I want it to be a unicorn and sparkly. And I was like, I can do that. <laughs> Found unicorn charms. And I'm telling you, when this little girl comes back, she's getting one for free because this was a good idea. <laughs> Oh, I have a little girl. What do little oh, girls do? come in? Yeah, what do they come in there for? Just like they just wander in or they're looking for something special? Same, oh, same thing. I feel like them and all the dogs that come in, like they can feel my energy. Like they just, they come in and I don't know how they know. Some guy was walking by once and I was outside and he goes, you know, these little girls think you're a fairy princess. And I was like, oh, my God, but I feel like they do. And uh, so one little girl came in and the shop is like kind of dark. Like originally I was like, it's going to be bright pink. But then it was like dark gray. And I have photos of dead birds all over the walls. And this little girl's looking around and she was like, I love it in here. She's like, this is like if Alice in Wonderland fell down the hole and never came out. And she got a little depressed, but not in a bad way. She's still happy. <laughs> I was like thank you like that's the best thing someone could have said to me is that how you might describe your store then uh, totally yes <laughs> so then let me ask you what is the kind of typical customer if there is such a thing because it seems like there's maybe a really wide range it's a really wide range and like I'm grateful for that because that that's what I want it to be. I'm really bad at marketing that's something I still have to work out but I know you're supposed to have like a target audience and I don't, I have older women, I have little girls, I've got some little boys, like it's all of them, young boys, young girls, they all come in, they, most of them find stuff. So yeah, just, I don't know. Well, that's amazing. Individual, like, yeah. And yes, so in terms of clothing that you have in the store, you have clothes for everyone. Yeah, I try to. And it's hard because it's a small shop. So I don't have like, you know, a million things. Uh, but I do, I, I started the kid stuff because a mom came in with her kid and the kid was so excited to be there. And the mom was like, don't touch anything. There's nothing here for you. There's nothing here for you. And I was like, mm, there should be something here for them. So I even have like the kids rack is like low to the ground so they can, they can shop. Oh, that's adorable. <laughs> yeah. It's so what fun. about the different services that you offer? I know that you do um, sewing, alterations, et cetera. You can do upcycling. Uh, I saw maybe you do some like styling as well. What are all of the, the services that, that are available at the store? Um, so right now, mostly what I'm doing service wise is like I can make custom pieces of jewelry for people if I have the stuff in the store and I have some like necklaces on tarot cards and I can, you know, if someone has a specific need, I can pick the right stone and pick the right card for them. Um, I was doing some like upcycling for other people. Um but that got a little tricky. It was, I was, I did a jacket for this guy. He wanted all these patches on his jacket, but they were, he had picked them out and they had a lot of like um, glue on the back. So they were really hard to sew and probably took me four or five days. And it just at the end wasn't, wasn't worth it. Um, but they, I do, I have worked again, little kids um, making them special jackets. Like I have a bunch of fabric in the back and I can pull it out and they can kind of pick what they want. I, when I was a little girl, I used to go to thrift stores for all of like some of costumes and like things, performances and things like that. So I imagine that your store is amazing for, for little kids looking for, for something special. Yeah, totally. And even for big kids, like I know it's not practical, but whenever I find like a dance costume or something fluffy, I'm like, that's coming into the store. Someone's going to want it. <laughs> So what are some of the most common misconceptions people have about vintage clothing um, oh. and secondhand clothing? It's a really good question. Um, I think like my pet peeve around that is a lot of larger sized women need larger sizes. It is hard to find larger sizes, but if I find them, I'm going to bring them into the store. And I can't tell you how many people will not come into the store. They stand outside the store and they say, this looks cute. There's nothing here that's going to fit me. And they walk away and I'm like, oh, there is stuff here. But then it just sits here because you won't come in and look. Um, yeah, that's that's hard. Oh, OK. 
And if somebody's looking for something special, like you have a regular customer or something, and they're like, look, I'm looking for this one thing. If you find some, or if you see it, could you let me know or would you bring it into the store? Did that happen a lot? Yeah, I love when that happens. It doesn't happen that often. And even it's not even that specific as much as there. I have a couple of ladies who shop and I kind of know their style and I'll find things and I'll be like, oh, so-and-so would like this. Um, there's this woman, Nick, she is so supportive of the shop. And I find a lot of things I'm like, Nick's going to like this. And I'll put it on Instagram and she's like, oh my God. I'm like, I knew it. I knew that was for you. <laughs> Perfect. So yeah. then let's look ahead for 2023. We're halfway through the year. What are your plans for the second half of the year, yourself and the shop? Oh, that's, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, I'm going to take vacation in a month for the first time since uh, quarantine. <laughs> so oh my gosh. Wow. That is a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to just... close the shop or is somebody going to run it for you? I'm going to close it. I, so I've been there for four years, but I still haven't made any money and I'm still having trouble even paying myself. So it doesn't make sense to try to pay another person. I'll just close the shop and, and go. And I'm hoping like with all my heart, there's been a lot of girls coming in who are like, oh, I just moved here. Oh, I just moved here. And a lot of moms coming in being like, oh, I just visited my daughter. I'm going to tell her about your shop. I'm hoping that happens and that people come in so that like, maybe I can make a little bit of a profit this year. Maybe I don't have to freak out about trying to get another job so I can pay myself. Yeah, that would be nice. Okay. So then my next question would be, what are the, some of the biggest challenges you're facing in 2023 and that you, you're, you've answered that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just getting more foot traffic through the door. Exactly. Okay. And what are you most excited about for this year? That vacation. <laughs> That vacation and hopefully just keep those girls coming in like the the most recent crop of girls that are like oh I just moved here again great girls like I really enjoy them being in the shop and I would love to keep seeing them and keep having conversations with them awesome okay well hopefully this and some other activities that we can collaborate on we'll we'll keep that rolling yeah get some more foot traffic in the door yes so please. now we've come to kind of a set of questions that we ask everybody. Um, so I'll ask you three questions. What do you feel like is your biggest success today? And this doesn't have to be strictly business, but in opening and running the store, what do you feel like your, you know, is your biggest success, your biggest achievement? Uh, the community, the community that I've created, like inside my store. That's what I wanted. I mean, every <laughs> I say community because I want to sound professional, but like it's my friends. I made a bunch of friends and I'm really, really happy about that. Awesome. Okay. And the flip side of that, what do you feel like is your biggest failure? However you define that. Oh, I, so yeah, I was thinking about this question and I don't really like the term failure. Um, I, I was framing it in my mind as I wish this was different. I know my biggest failure is that like when I opened the shop, I was like, I'm going to be the best person to everyone. And they're going to be so happy to come in here and meet me. And I'm going to be so joyful and happy to have them in. But then when my dad passed away and my sister moved home and now I, I was like, I will have one day off and I can manage this with one day off. But now I go home on that day so my sister can have a break and I take care of my mom, which is to say that sometimes when I'm in the shop, I'm sad. And I know that I'm not my best self. And I know that I'm not giving every customer 100% of myself. And that feels like a failure to me. And I'm sorry that that is what it is. Yeah, it's that's that's very honest. And I think a lot of folks who are starting up, and this is, I mean, starting a business is so taxing in a very unique way that's different. It's different than like, adolescence is you know surviving it's, being a teenager it's different than being like having a young kid it's different than it's, you know it's so it's different very unique I'm really glad you guys have this podcast because I've been listening to it and it makes me feel so less alone because yeah you if you haven't done this it's like you don't I don't even know how to tell you what's going on you know like it's hard <laughs> it really ranges the gamut from you know you could have extreme like insomnia to like you can't it's just it runs the gamut of every yeah. kind of emotion and everything it's really hard it is difficult to explain which is why we love getting communities of entrepreneurs together even if it's you know just to 
be like, oh, okay, thank goodness. I'm not the only one here. Oh, yeah. A million percent. <laughs> so then what do you think the biggest or the most important lesson is that you've learned? Ooh, this is a good question. And I've been struggling with it. I, I don't know. Um, I think I was talking to my friends about it. Cause I was like, I don't know what lesson I've learned. I think I do know. I do know one. And I was kind of hoping this would be the case starting the business um, as much as, you know, like it takes community. And I was hoping that, you know, I would people would come into my store like minded people and we would be friends. And that has happened. And because of that, like one of my friends um, made the logo for the shop and like it's beautiful. And another one of my friends is going to make a sign to put outside the shop. And like another one of my friends that helped me set, you know, put a sign outside the shop just to be like, you know, do you watch 90 Day Fiance? Come in and talk with me. And I've made more friends that way and had more people come in. But so like I've learned that putting yourself out there and sort of being open and vulnerable, again, like it really does bring it back to you. And then my friend said this, and I am proud of it, because like I said, when when my father passed away, I just remember saying to all my friends, I gave myself one day off a week and now I won't have any days off and I can't do it. I don't think I can do this. And my friend was like, look, you did it. You're still doing it. You learn that you can. That's a good one. That's a really important <laughs> one. That's really important for, for everybody, but especially entrepreneurs to think when you're like, oh my God, what am I doing? Because there will be points when you look around in the chaos and you're like, what am I doing? Yeah. And then somebody reminds you, you're doing no, you're, it. You're doing it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, good for your friend for saying that. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So just two more. If you could get 85% of the world to adopt a single behavior, what would that be? Boom. Um, it would be about pets adopt, don't shop. I love animals. I love animals so much. Uh, all the dogs that come into the store and every Saturday we celebrate Catterday. So if you have a pet, if you show me a picture, you get 10% off. And the idea behind that is like my cat loves his toys and I'm a poor lady. So if I could save money any which way, I'm going to use that money to buy him more toys. Oh, speak of the devil. Here he is. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And then tell us, where can we find you? Uh, oh, uh, so my store is at 1084 Bedford Ave in bed -Stuy. Uh, I'm on Instagram at Candy Colored Girl Vintage. Um, that's pretty much it, I think. Awesome. Okay. Nora, thank you so much for chatting with us today. Oh, thank you. I really, really enjoyed this. It means a lot to me. If you're in the New York City area, for everybody out there listening, make a special trip to Brooklyn, to bed -Stuy, to visit Candy Colored Girl. I certainly will the next time I'm in town. And yes. for everyone, yeah, I'm. I can't <laughs> wait to come. I'm gonna bring my little girl, and we're gonna I was go gonna nuts say, in this bring store. Her totally, she'll have fun. I promise. <laughs> I will for sure. Thank mm -hmm. you to everyone in the audience, and we'll see you on B one.